Howdy and welcome to Wise About Texas. I'm your host, Ken Wise, and thank you for tuning in today for a little Texas history. This podcast is being released in the fall of 2021, so that's hunting and football season here in Texas, one of my favorite times of the year. I hope you're enjoying those activities and enjoying a little bit of cooler weather. It's been a very, very busy time here at World Headquarters. Um, we I just finished an article that's going to publish in the Texas Supreme Court Historical Society Journal this fall, which uh, will be the subject of this podcast. We'll get to in a few minutes. I've uh, Long-time listeners know I've joined the board of the Texas State Historical Association and uh, also the Texas Historical Foundation. And um, the, both of those organizations do a wonderful job of preserving Texas history, and uh, I'm enjoying my service very much. It's more important than ever that we all get together, uh, those of us that love Texas, we all get together and preserve real Texas history because uh, our history is under attack, as everybody knows. And I'm going to do my part, and I hope you'll do your part, too. Well, today I'm going to start with part one of what will be a multiple-part episode on a very significant event in Texas history, indeed, in United States history. Now, that's a big statement. But in the late 19th century, especially on the western frontier in northern Texas, Relations with the Plains Indians was something that the people thought about a lot. Now, listeners of this podcast will know that as Texas settlement expanded west, the Plains tribes, and specifically for the purposes of these next several episodes, the Comanches and the Kiowas, made western expansion in the United States very, very dangerous. In fact, it was basically a full-fledged war on the Plains. But in late 1871, several things came together at the same time. First, the United States government's new policy in dealing with violent Indian tribes. Second, the Plains Indians' culture and their inter- its intersection with government policy. Also at play was the desire of government officials to find every possible way to impose civilization on the Plains Indians, and finally, the desire of the United States to impose the rule of law on a violent frontier, at the same time seemingly desiring to avoid violence. And in the middle of all this, Texans were being murdered. Their children were being carried off as captives, their livestock was being stolen, and their homesteads were being burned. So something had to give. So let's go back to the Texas frontier right after the Civil War, and get wise about Texas. From 1861 to 1865, Texas was one of the states in the Confederate States of America. And Texas organized a few different military organizations to protect the frontier, but they always seemed to get absorbed into the Confederate Army at one point or another. Naturally, Just because of its sheer size, if for no other reason, the frontier was left lightly guarded, and the Indians, primarily the Comanches and the Kiowas, took advantage of that. They began raiding deeper into Texas during the war. Things were getting bad, and the citizens pled with the government to do something about it. Governor Francis Lubbock, who was one of the governors during the Civil War, even exempted the men that lived on the frontier from the draft into the Confederate Army so that they could stay home and protect their homes. Now, early in the war, 1862, cattleman Oliver Loving, now y'all will remember Oliver Loving from episode 72, where I did an episode about his death. Uh, Oliver Loving was partners with Charles Goodnight. They founded the very famous Goodnight Loving Cattle Trail up into Colorado. Uh, Loving's Ranch was west of Fort Worth and um, in the Jacksboro area. And he wrote to Governor Francis Lubbock about the Indians raiding into Texas and pushing back the line of settlement. He warned him about that in 1860, as early as 1862. Now, let me tell you uh, what a typical Indian raid might look like. Now, this is not a description of a specific raid, but I've read dozens and dozens of accounts from various places, and there are some things that a lot of them had in common. Uh, 
Um, some, and I'll be as gentle as I can with this. Sometimes the, the horses or cattle or sheep or goats would be stolen without anything else happening, without the home being attacked or anything like that, but not usually. The Indians would attack a house. They would kill the men or anyone else that resisted, uh, capture or kill the women, and capture the children if they thought that they could either be sold later or incorporated into the tribe. And if you want to learn more about some of the some of the reasons behind that and kind of the the culture of the raids or whatever, I highly recommend Empire of the Summer Moon, which I know uh, from feedback many of y'all have already read. Um, the brutality of these raids is hard for us to imagine today. Scalping was done either before or after the death of the person being scalped. Warriors would take turns spearing the victims, which was almost a ritual. Uh, sometimes multiple warriors would shoot arrows into the victims, pinning them to the ground. Um, women were, in the language of the time, brutalized or ravaged repeatedly, uh, as were the captives. Uh, so these raids were um, full and final, very violent and very brutal. Now, sometimes you'd get someone that could escape, but not often. If you want to read more about uh, what would happen to these captives, one very famous Indian captive, Rachel Plummer, wrote her recollections of the famous Parker raid where Cynthia Ann Parker was captured. And uh, Rachel Plummer's narrative is just absolutely uh, astounding and hence brutality. Uh, the point is, a raid was a fight to the death. Uh, Rachel Plummer actually, she wrote, she recalled a Comanche t- chief telling her, quote, uh, and this is her quote, so it's her translation, when Indians fight, the winner gives or takes the life of the defeated, and he rarely spares them, close quote. So this was a very uh, violent culture, and the brutality uh, that I've described is what an Indian would expect happened to him if he lost the fight. And that's one reason why those fights were so intense. So this was all going on on the northwestern frontier of Texas, and the people were demanding some relief. So let me tell you uh, where kind of where we're talking about. So picture on a map Fort Worth and go west. Um, I-20 runs through Albany, and Abilene, and that would be kind of the lower portion of the area we're describing. And then if you go a little bit north, you get into the Jacksboro Graham country and and then north from there into Oklahoma, which I'll get to in a minute. And so that's kind of the area we're talking about. Let me read you a couple of letters from Lampasas County, which having said that was the area we're talking about. This is a little bit outside of there. It's a little bit south of where the main story will take place. Lampasas County is between Colleen and San Saba. Um, this is July 1866, and this will give you an idea of what was going on. A guy named Thomas Adams wrote a letter, and he writes that his horses were stolen in the morning about an hour after his neighbor's horses and other stock had been stolen. He said that Indians were depredating daily, and they had to have protection or they were going to have to leave the area. And later that same month, from the same county, there was a petition that was sent to Governor, at this point, James Throckmorton, with 60 names on it. And this petition is from Lampasas County, and in it they complain of no protection from the government. And here's here's a portion of the letter, quote, Whole settlements have been broken up. Families reduced from affluence to want. The rewards of a lifetime of industry have passed off before their eyes and the scalping knife no unfrequently used. Allegiance on the part of the people and protection by the government appear to be reciprocal duties. Close quote. Now, that's a very interesting quote, especially for uh, our present times. Allegiance on the part of the people and protection by the government appear to be reciprocal duties. So this is after the Civil War, uh, the citizens of Lampasas County. So let's move into the area where our story is going to take place. And this is three days after that petition sent was sent to Throckmorton. There's another petition, and this one came from people from six counties. Wise County, and yes, before you uh, wonder, that is a distant relative. That county was named for a distant relative of mine, Henry Wise from Virginia. Um, Wise County, Cook County, Montague County, Clay County, Jack County, and Young County. 
All right. So those six counties, and this is right where our story is going to take place. They sent a petition to Throckmorton, and this petition was signed by about 150 people. And it stated that Indian raids are occurring with a boldness never known before. Here's what they wrote, quote, We are apprised the regular force of the United States are entirely unable to give protection at this time to the frontiers, asks governor to authorize the citizens to raise their own force to protect their homes, close quote. So things were getting desperate. Um, and if you think about it, after the Civil War, uh, Texas rejoins the United States And this is during the period of Reconstruction. So now the federal government is responsible for the frontier, but they're not getting it done. They're not protecting the border area, if that sounds familiar to anybody. So the citizens are asking for permission to raise official military forces and do it themselves. In 1867, that same governor, Throckmorton, reported to the federal government that since the end of the war in 1865, so in the last couple of years, 162 people had been killed by Indians on the frontier. 43 had been captured and 24 had been wounded. Throckmorton reports that over 30,000 head of cattle, 3,000 head of horses, 2,000 head of sheep and goats had been stolen or destroyed. And despite uh, whatever state or federal attempts there were to protect that frontier, Indian raids, one lady from Jack County wrote, Indian raids were a weekly experience. Well, what was out there and available to protect the frontier? Um, When Texas became a state in the 1840s, the federal government built a line of forts. And they were building them pretty fast as as Texas expanded west. And uh, the line of forts is probably worthy of its own episode. But some of the forts that were built were not even occupied because the frontier was moving so quickly to the West and the government was trying to keep up and build forts, but the frontier would move so fast soldiers couldn't even get there to occupy them. Well, one of the forts that we're going to be concerned with is Fort Richardson, which was actually built after the civil war and Fort Griffin, which was also built after the civil war. Fort Richardson is located right outside of Jacksboro, Texas, and Fort Griffin right outside of Albany, Texas. Um, We're also going to talk a lot about Fort Sill, which is uh, in what is now Oklahoma, um, but right after the Civil War was called Indian Territory. Now, we also need to mention Indian reservations. As the U.S. expanded, the frontier residents um, obviously came into conflict with Indian tribes, and some of this was self-induced. The government relocated Indians over periods of years to certain lands, and then the U.S. would expand onto those lands anyway. Um, Many tribes were pushed from their homes in the east to the west. It became a real problem when the U.S. started to expand onto the Great Plains and ran into those tribes, the Sioux, the Comanche, the Kiowa. The government tried to solve this problem with uh, the Medicine Lodge Treaty, In 1867, the government signed three treaties at a place called Medicine Lodge Creek near Medicine Lodge, Kansas. One treaty was made with the Kiowa and the Comanches, and a second um, with the sort of joined the Plains Apache with the Kiowa and Comanche, and a third was negotiated with the Arapaho and the Cheyenne. The United States promised that the tribes, that there would be peace and protection from. Expand, American expansion, and in return, uh, they would go to the reservations in the western part of what was called Indian Territory. And the Senate ratified those treaties in 1868. That was a big treaty, and it was um, thought that it was going to really make an impact. And what those treaties did, in short, was defined some reservation boundaries, created the idea of an Indian agent and what uh, the government was going to do for the tribes. And the thinking was that these reservations would be places where the Indians could, for lack of a better term, practice their lifestyle, uh, roam around, hunt wherever they wanted, um, that sort of thing. The the government did not fully understand uh, Indian culture, and some might argue still doesn't, but um, that was the idea. We're going to set these reservations aside, 
and the Indian tribes will live on them, and they won't bother the American settlers. Um, and you can think what you want to about that program, but we're going to see whether that worked or not. Um, the Indian agent was charged with overseeing the affairs on the reservation, overseeing the construction of buildings, uh, residences, schoolhouses. You can see there was also an acculturation program. They were going to bring uh, – the U.S. government was going to bring its idea of civilization to these tribes on the reservation. He was also, um, the agent was also charged with enforcing um, the parts of the treaty, the various parts of the treaty. And then uh, I mentioned the government obligations to the tribe. So what these treaties would do would create a welfare program, essentially, and they would provide the Indians with what are called, depending on where you're reading, annuity goods or rations, um, some records even call it tribute, um, but they included things like clothes, implements for farming. Um, now, let me stop right there for a minute. Think about what I'm talking about. Put yourself back at that time, and you're a government official in Washington, D.C., and you've never seen a Comanche or a Kiowa in the, in the flesh. You have no idea what it's like on the frontier and you say you know what we'll just we'll make this simple we'll teach them to farm and um yeah if you've read anything about the plains indians you can you could have predicted how this was going to go anyway uh, commentary over that that's uh, one of the aspects of this the themes of this that that occurs over and over um another provision of the treaties uh, restricted hunting off the reservation so there would be some some buffalo hunting some bison hunting off the reservation but it would have to occur south of the arkansas river now uh, as you can tell from that rundown of medicine lodge uh, the treaties did not work out well and in 2021 it doesn't do us it's not extremely useful to assign blame both sides failed to honor a number of articles in those treaties um, and then washington dc politics got involved and there was a power struggle between the house of representatives and the senate over who controlled treaty making with uh, the indians and so treaty making essentially stopped after medicine lodge um, and the welfare program as with these sorts of big government programs didn't work well either um, the money wouldn't be appropriated for the goods that were due under these treaties. They'd be delayed. Uh, as a result, the Indians wouldn't get what they felt like they deserved under the treaty. Not only that, but again, with big government programs, you get waste, inefficiency, outright fraud. Uh, goods weren't getting to the reservation, even if they were there. Um, so the Indians would suffer from... Uh, they wouldn't get their food. They wouldn't get their clothing. Forget farming. We don't even get that far. And when that happened, they would do what their culture demanded, and they would raid, and they would, um, which of course was a violation of the treaty. So uh, that raiding uh, tended to occur uh, down on the northwestern frontier of Texas. Um, but it wasn't just because. Uh, they weren't getting the goods. That was that was part of the motivation, but also because raiding was part of the culture. So despite the fact that goods were and were not arriving, I mean, they did work to some degree, uh, but raiding would occur anyway. It was a cultural thing um, to achieve status and prominence in these plains cultures. Uh, raiding and fighting was part of the deal. Um, so... Let's talk for Medicine Lodge for our purposes. Uh, we're going to focus on the Kiowa tribe, and several of the chiefs are going to play into our story. And so the ones that signed the Medicine Lodge Treaty were Satank, which tra that's spelled S A T A N K, that translates to sitting bear. Another one is Satanta, which tra that's S A T A N T A, that translates to white bear. And a few others were Lone Wolf, Kicking Bird, and Black Eagle. And those chiefs, uh, if you read about the Kiowas, are well-known, very prominent chiefs. The government's position in all of this was that the reservation system 
was for the Indians protection. So this is a, a good caution from history. Anytime the government says they're going to going to make you do something for your own good, uh, I would tend not to believe it. All right. So we have the reservation system that's set up. We also had something that arose called the peace policy or the Quaker peace policy. So right after the civil war, the president is Ulysses S. Grant. And this is a couple of years after Medicine Lodge. It's about 1869. Grant instituted what has come to be called Grant's Peace Policy or the Peace Policy or the Quaker Peace Policy, depending on what you're reading. I'm just going to call it the Peace Policy. Um, the reason it's sometimes called the Quaker Peace Policy was because the Quakers, or uh, the, their real name is the Society of Friends, a religious organization, a denomination, had lobbied for this peace policy. Um, by the way, uh, the Indian Indian affairs were transferred to the War Department at the end of the Civil War, uh, which had alarmed the Quakers in the East and sort of gave them the idea for this. So the idea behind the peace policy was for religious officials to become these Indian agents and to model peace to the Indians on the reservation. And they were from all different denominations, but the overwhelming majority, almost all of them, were Quakers. And uh, the Quaker religion is a religion of pacifism, among other things. So the Indian agent for the Kiowas and the Comanches was a Quaker from Iowa named Laurie, L-A-W-R-I-E, Tatum. And Tatum wrote a memoir after his service, and it's called Our Red Brothers, and that's about his time as an Indian agent. And he starts it off by pointing out how well the Quakers got along with the Indians in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. And he contrasts that, as he must, with the War on the Plains, which um, occurred, among other places, in Texas. And the, the Quakers felt that since they approached Indian relations from a Christian standpoint, um, they modeled Christian behavior and they modeled peace, that they would have a civilizing effect on the Indians, that they could teach the Indians to farm. They could make sure that these government welfare programs were executed honestly, that there wasn't any theft. Everybody got what they were supposed to get. And they were sure that the Indians would respond to this. The Plains Indians would respond to this kindness because after all, it had worked in the Northeast. Well, uh, by the end of the three or however many parts that this, uh, that this story takes, on this podcast, um, you will learn along with Tatum as he learned that that was the Indians of the plains and the Indians of the Northeast were not the same, but from a historical standpoint, does the idea that a group of, uh, religious folks are going to come in on a frontier and quote unquote, civilize the Indians that are there and teach them to farm and otherwise, in other words, change their culture, uh, and do so under the auspices of Christianity while probably converting them all. That sounds a lot like the Spaniards in the 16 and 1700s, doesn't it? So that tells you why you ought to study history. Well, President Grant liked the idea. He agreed to it, and uh, Larry, Larry Tatum takes his place as the Indian agent for the Kiowas and Comanches at Fort Sill in Indian Territory. So now we have the reservations in place. We have the Medicine Lodge Treaty and more, not so much the treaty, but the schemes under the treaty, the welfare programs and the reservation idea and et cetera in place. And Tatum, the Quaker Indian agent is in place and the problem is ready to be solved. Don't you think? Well, <clears throat> not so fast. Um, the problem was, as Tatum learned, the Indians were not staying on the reservations. They hunted and raided all down into Texas, as I described earlier. Uh, I also mentioned that the Plains culture brings you glory if you're a great hunter and a great warrior. And horses are currency, so stealing horses is a big deal. Um, also, if the Indians took captives, the government would ransom the captives back. They'd pay a ransom. So why not get as many captives as you could? I mean, that's the incentive that's created by that behavior. Um, another interesting aspect, and if you read uh, 
some of the right some of the records of what the Indians were saying during the many meetings at the Indians Indian agency and you read sometimes between the lines but sometimes they out and out say it the Indians felt there was a big difference between Indian territory and Texas they didn't understand that that was all part of the same country or they didn't care and so the idea that they did not raid in Oklahoma but raided in Texas that was fine they didn't view that as a as a violation of any treaty um, at one point there's a quote from Satanta later on that says, um, and I'll probably read it in a later episode, the whole speech, but he said something like, we're not going to raid around here, but we will raid into Texas. So they viewed uh, that there was a big difference, and of course the government didn't view it that way, and nobody seemed to discuss that with each other. Um, So for purposes of this episode, people, places, and policy, let's summarize where we are in the spring of 1871. We have the reservation in what is now western Oklahoma. We have severe and frequent raiding Indian raids on the Texas frontier, which had moved east during the Civil War. We had the welfare schemes and agents in place after Medicine Lodge, and we had the peace policy. So now let's talk, in addition to Lowry Tatum, about some of the people that are going to be involved. We already covered Tatum. He's a Quaker Indian agent from Iowa. Let's talk about William Tecumseh Sherman. Now, his name is not uttered with much favor in the South, particularly the Southeast, because of his conduct during the Civil War and his um, essential invention of the concept of total war against the people of the South, uh, where he would um, burn and loot his way Uh, to his objective. Um, However, he was very effective. And after the Civil War, he became what amounts to the only the third commanding general of the army in U.S. history behind George Washington and Ulysses Grant. And there haven't been that many more since then. He was a four-star general. And uh, then in World War II, they created a five-star rank. But so he was general of the army. And he will uh, factor into our story. The next person is Texas Governor Edmund J. Davis. Now, if you'll go back a long way back to Episode 9 of Wise About Texas, I talked about E.J. Davis and his uh, election in 1873. Now, our story is taking place in 1871. Davis is the a Reconstruction governor of Texas, not well regarded, to say the least. He had been a district judge before the war. Um, but when the Civil War started, he you know, he was a Unionist, but he actually joined the Union Army. Uh, the citizens regarded him much differently than Sam Houston. You remember Sam Houston was opposed to secession, but Houston did the honorable thing, forfeited his office as governor, and retired. Davis actually took up arms against his fellow Texans. And while he was governor, he had what amounted to a private police force that he wasn't afraid to use. Um, He would do things like declare martial law in a county and then uh, send the county a bill for it. So he he was just not very well liked. But, you know, in 1871, Reconstruction was coming to an end pretty soon. And Davis, if he wanted to remain governor, would have to run for election. So he didn't need the headache of these Indian raids on the northwestern frontier. The citizens were demanding action, and even Davis uh, felt some accountability to those citizens. Now, we also need to meet some of the Kiowa chiefs. And the first is Satank. And that, as I mentioned earlier, translates to sitting bear. I'm going to use the name Satank. We think Satank was born about 1800, probably near the Black Hills of South Dakota. He was uh, an elite warrior. He was a member. Now, I'm going to mispronounce this, but uh, there was a warrior society in the Kiowa tribe called the Koitsinko, and it's spelled K-O-I-T-S-E-N-K-O, the Koitsinko Warrior Society. It was the 10 most elite warriors of the entire tribe, and Satank was one of those. Satank had uh, one of his sons, his oldest son, I believe, was killed in a raid into Texas, which profoundly affected him. He carried his son's bones with him uh, 
for the rest of his life. Uh, he would put the bones on a separate horse. When they were riding, he would set up a separate lodge for the bones and put food and water in there with the bones. So in addition to being a fierce warrior, he was also uh, very vengeful. And uh, understandably, if his son was killed, I suppose. Um, one side story about Satank. He went uh, back to the site of the raid on which his son was killed and he stole a mule. His son was killed in a raid where they had been trying to steal some mules. So he went back to the site and stole a mule. And one day in 1870, he rode that mule to the agency to meet with Larry Tatum. And the mule's owner had identified it to Tatum as his. And Tatum looked, and sure enough, it had the brand on it. But Satank said, look, I stole this from the area where my son was killed. And so now I love this mule like a son, and I should be allowed to keep it. Um, well, Tatum didn't agree and made him give it back. And when he did that, when he ordered him to give it back, Satank, who at this time was about 70 years old, challenged Tatum to a fight to the death on the prairie. He said, you and I will go out on the prairie. We'll fight to the death, and whoever wins can keep the mule. So Satank, to say the least, was an old school warrior. Well, next we need to make we need to meet uh, Satanta. Satanta translates to white bear. Um, his actually his original name as an infant was Big Ribs, because he was a, a large baby and turned out to be a large adult. He was born, we think, between probably 1815 and 1818. Now, all these we thinks and maybes and probabilities are coming out because the Kiowas didn't have a written record of their history. They would do what we call now a calendar at an annual gathering, and they would draw the significant events that happened to the tribe since the last uh, time the calendar was done. They would draw it on, on a big hide. So you'd have this, this um, hide stretched out with a series of pictures in a circle or circles, and that was the only history they had. So we, we will never know for sure um, when Satanta was born. But think about 1815, 1818. Uh, Satanta claimed that uh, his mother was actually a Arapaho. Um, he was the son of a prominent medicine man named Red Tipi, who took great care to groom Satanta for great things. He was big, as I mentioned, big guy, physically big. He was loud. He was prone to long speeches. Um, he was regarded by everybody that ever dealt with him as intelligent, but unfortunately that wasn't really rewarded um, in Plains culture. He needed to be a warrior. He was also very shrewd, uh, which was rewarded in the culture, um, and not without honor. One side story about Satanta, and I'm doing this from my recollection, so uh, bear with me, but he, they were the Kiowa were fighting the Pawnee, and uh, some members of the army were patrolling and rode up, and they see this lone rider coming, this lone Indian rider, and it's Satanta. And he comes over the hill, and he's been wounded, and he said, my gun is empty. And on an impulse, one of the officers gave him, handed him a pistol. He rode back over the hill, completed the fight, and disappeared. Years later, uh, that same officer is part of a bunch of soldiers that end up captured by the Kiowas. Satanta walks out, sees him. They look at each other. They know they've seen each other somewhere before. And all of a sudden, this fight occurred in Arkansas, by the way. All of a sudden, uh, Satanta runs up and screams Arkansas and gives him a huge hug and gives everybody their horses back and lets him go. So Satanta, um, oh, he also signed the Medicine Lodge Treaty, as I'd mentioned. He made, you know, long boasting speeches. One writer referred to Satanta as the orator of the plains. Uh, he was very popular among the Kiowa and considered, if not their principal war chief, certainly top tier. And he loved a good fight, whether that fight was on the prairie or at the Indian agency arguing with the government. He very much enjoyed his status. Now, there's one more chief that I want to mention, and this one is Big Tree. Now, I call him a chief. He was very young, and he was an up-and-comer uh, to be a war chief. Uh, he was born, we think, about 1850, and he had already 
even as a young man, as, a, as barely 20 years old, had led a raid into Montague County in North Texas. And on this raid, he did something that, that uh, happened over and over, unfortunately, on the prairie, and he snatched a crying baby from its mother, killed it, and threw it back at the mother. Now, that's a, a terrible, terrible thing, uh, but we're going to revisit that as we learn what happened to Big Tree. The point is, at this, at this point in our story, he was an up-and-coming war chief, um, he had the brutal, the fierceness to be a great warrior in the Kiowa culture. All right, so let's set the scene. The Kiowas are supposed to be on the reservation, hunting and living their lives. They are expecting their rations from the U.S. government at, at the agency at Fort Sill. Their agent is the Quaker Lawry Tatum. None of those things are happening. Uh, the goods are not coming like they should. And uh, they're not, the Kiowas are not staying on the reservation. The Kiowas and the Comanches and others are raiding into Texas. And in fact, um, the person I mentioned earlier from Jack County is named Ida Huckabay. And she wrote that the raids were happening every week. Um, livestock is stolen. Homesteads looted and burned. People are being killed and captured. The forts are around. The army is around. But they aren't protecting the frontier and they aren't stopping the raiding. Uh, because the go- official government peace policy is to lead with diplomacy rather than recognize what they're dealing with. So Tatum is trying to manage all this. He's caught between an inefficient government and a fierce group of very competent but very violent Indian tribes, and the citizens are in an uproar. Governor Davis needs to do something, but as a Reconstruction governor, he is accountable to the same federal government running this peace policy. And not only that, uh, but because Texas is back in the United States, all of this is the federal government's responsibility. Something had to give. But a classic problem rears its head in this situation. The center of the government in Washington, D.C., thousands of miles away from the frontier, had a tough time believing that the problem was really as bad as it was being represented. Uh, the Easterners favored the peace policy uh, because, as so often happens, they don't have to live with the consequences of their policy. And that sounds a little familiar, probably. Um, finally, General Sherman, who had his doubts too, even though he was an accomplished military officer, decided to personally inspect the forts along the frontier and assess the situation for himself. So in the spring of 1871, General Sherman set out from Washington for a tour of the frontier. As William Sherman was steaming between New Orleans, Mobile, and finally Galveston, an unidentified settler was scalped alive on Salt Creek west of Jacksboro, where Fort Richardson, which was to be one of Sherman's stops, was located. The next night, Several citizens were attacked within sight of Fort Richardson. The next day, some folks got their horses stolen a mere three miles from the fort. In fact, in the spring of 1871, as Sherman planned his visit, 14 people were killed just in that area. And soon, Sherman would see exactly how dangerous Texas was. Well, now we come to the part of the episode I call Getting There, where I tell you how to go see some of the places mentioned in the episode. I'm going to mention just a couple of places, and then we'll expand this list in the future parts of this story. First is Fort Richardson, which is on Highway 380 just south of Jacksboro, and you can go there and see some restored buildings as they would have looked at the time of this story. Next is Fort Griffin, which is on Highway 283 north of Albany, Texas, And there are some remnants of the actual buildings of Fort Griffin. Both of those forts, Richardson and Griffin, were going to be stops on Sherman's tour in 1871. Interestingly, Fort Griffin has the official Longhorn herd of the state of Texas. So that's definitely worth a visit. So those are two places. And uh, this list is going to expand as I release the other parts of the story. Those are two places to put on your list. They're going to play very important roles coming up. Well, that wraps it up for part one of this episode. Go find Wise About Texas on Twitter and Instagram at Wise About Texas. 
Like and share the Wise About Texas Facebook page. And if you get a chance, leave us a five-star review on iTunes or Apple Podcasts. That helps people find the show, and I appreciate everyone who's done that. If you want to support the preservation and promotion of Texas history, go to patreon.com slash wiseabouttexas, and you can support the show. Stay tuned. Coming soon, part two of this episode, The Raid. Go out and do something for Texas today, folks. And until next time, God bless Texas, and we'll see you down the road.